So hi everyone, good evening and welcome. My name is Richie Demada and I'll be your main host for tonight. We are so happy that you're here with us. Um, before we start, I would like to thank our sponsors for making this event possible. I'm gonna be reading a list just to be upfront because there's a couple of them who made it possible. Thank you so much. Um, UC Berkeley's Division of Equity and Inclusion, Asian American Research Center, Asian Pacific American Student Development Office, the Cal Alumni Association, the UC Berkeley's Philippinex American Alumni Chapter, um, UC Riverside Center for Ideas and Society, and of course, UC Davis's Blossom Center for Filipino Studies. Um, I would also like to thank our moderator and panelists, Dr. Nefertiti Tadyar, Dr. Narisa Balse, Dr. Ricky Pantalan, and Dr. Dylan Rodriguez, and they'll all be introducing themselves in a little bit. Um, and of course, to our audience, thank you for joining again. Lastly, I just want to give a huge shout out to the Philippinex community here at UC Berkeley, from undergrads, grad students, faculty, alumni, and staff coming together to organize tonight's event and also the recent Philippinex um, town hall, community town hall. So thank you. Um, and last thing, uh, please uh, engage in the chat, um, but put your questions on the Q&A. Uh, because the chat, the chat goes really fast. So please, any questions, put on the Q&A and we will answer them at the end. Um, and tonight, I want to welcome Dr. Joy Varios, the lecturer of Filipino language studies here at UC Berkeley. We are so lucky to have her. She'll, she'll be here tonight to say some quick remarks and give context to why we are here tonight. Joy. Thank you, Fitzy. Last fall, UC Berkeley's main library held the exhibit entitled Celebrating 50 Years of Excellence, South and Southeast Asian Asia Scholarship and Stewardship at Berkeley, 1970 to 2020, featuring works by David Prescott Barrows and Alfred Lewis Krober. Barrows, in his book, calls Filipinas savage, uncivilized cannibals. This exhibit overlooked the histories and violence of the American col colonization of and imperialism in the Philippines. On October 28, 2022, leaders of the ASUC and the Graduate Assembly and representatives of Philippine X groups held a press conference and rally at the library steps. Students held up the following slogans, stop colonial amnesia, stop the glorification of colonizers, expose the white supremacist history of the South and Southeast Asian Studies Department, defend Filipino classes, imperialismo ibagsa, activism is not terrorism, and join the national democratic struggle of the Philippines. Tonight we are gathering as a community to create a space where we can discuss Filipinex American and Philippine history and the impacts of the American empire on our lived experiences. We hope that tonight's conversation and gathering can counter this colonial amnesia or the constant forgetting of the existence of Philippine nexus here in the United States and the constant erasure of our histories. More importantly, we hope that tonight's event can inspire all of us to continue to push, defend, and fight. Sumulong magtanggol, makibaka. Maraming salamat po. Thanks so much, Joy. And I just want to pass on the mic to um, our dear moderator tonight, Professor Neferti Sina Tadjar. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is um, Neferti Tadjar. I'm a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Barnard College, Columbia University. Um, I'm also the author of a couple of books on Philippine studies. Uh, and I'm very honored to be here um, and very pleased to uh, hear our panels uh, talk about this very important topic. So first of all, I would like to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Nerissa Balse. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, and uh, for friends who are joining from the Philippines, I know it is um, Good Friday. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, recognize that the people are here because they want to join this conversation uh, with us today. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, good morning. Maganda uh, Mumaga. My name is Narisa Balse. I'm an associate professor of Asian American Studies at SUNY Stony Brook. 
um, and uh, I write about uh, empire and the legacies of empire. Um, and my, my uh, work now is about looking at uh, the, the Duterte regime and uh, Filipino culture uh, under the Duterte regime. Salamat, I'm very happy to be here. Our, our next panelist is Ricky uh, Punsalan. Ricky? Hello, uh, magandang gabi. Um, so I'm Ricky Ponsalan, Associate Professor at the School of Information at the University of Michigan. Uh, my current project uh, involves working with uh, my co-faculty uh, here at Michigan, uh, Dr. Deirdre de la Cruz, uh, to um, look at the colonial collections of the university, particularly the, the ones uh, taken by um, Michigan academics and brought to campus. Uh, it's um, uh, just like Berkeley, Michigan is a big uh, collector of Philippine materials and uh, we are holding um, um, several uh, consultative uh, projects uh, involving community members of various uh, stripes, uh, you know, Filipinos in the Philippines and Philippinex communities and Filipinos in Ann Arbor and in Michigan and in, in the diaspora uh, to look at how do we um, uh, represent Philippine collections that uh, highlight the the, uh, the colonial legacies of uh, the United States. So thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And our final panelist uh, is uh, Dylan Rodriguez. Magandang gabi, magandang umaga. Um, good to see you all. Uh, Dylan Rodriguez, he, him pronouns. Talking to you from Kauia Luceno, occupied Kauia uh, Luceno Tongva land in Southern California. Uh, I work at UC Riverside, which is down the street from where Riverside Police Department stole the life of Taisha Miller in 1998. Um, by way of introduction, I've, I've been faculty member at UC Riverside for 21 years, but just as importantly, I did my graduate degree at UC Berkeley, where I met some of the beautiful people that are here. Um, and I'll say that I, I walk into and through what used to be called Barrows Hall almost every day. I stared at the ugly ass bust of Barrows almost every day. Um, I felt the evil course through that bust almost every day. Um, so I wanna start by saying fuck David Barrows and all of his intellectual inheritors. Welcome, thank you for having me. Okay, well that's going to send us off into, that gives us a good start. Um, so my first question I think that I would like to ask is um, precisely drawing on, um, on Joy Barrios' introduction, the connections between uh, this organized forgetting and education. So th the question is, what is the role of organized forgetting in relationship to particularly liberal education um, in the U.S.? Um, as we know, the model of U.S. liberal education didn't just simply extend to the Philippines, but actually, um, and, and we, we understand this through the introduction of the mass education system and so forth by the, by the U.S. government, but rather we can say that the liberal education itself, the model of it came out of, issued out of this colonial history, issued out of the colonial experiment of the Philippines. Now we normally understand a liberal education as premised on and promoting historical remembering, accounting and so forth, freedom of thought and speech. So what are your thoughts on the relation between what was called colonial amnesia and the current problems or challenges plaguing uh, public higher education today. And I'd like to turn to Nerissa Balse first. Well, I think that uh, lib the liberal education that we inherited uh, from the Americans is so beloved by, uh, by generations of Filipinos and we are part of this organized forgetting. We um, participate in, in colonial amnesia willingly. Uh, there is a phrase that I used to hear from my grandparents, uh, and I think some people would remember this, panahon ng Americano, but you know, a peacetime. They would collapse uh, the period after the war and constantly say that the American period was a time of peace. There is no way to talk about the violence and the horror of the Philippine-American war. And um, uh, 
uh, my dear peer and friend, uh, Dylan Rodriguez, uh, uh, reminded me that I too uh, walked in Barrows Hall for many years while I was writing um, my dissertation as an ethnic studies um, you know, a doctoral student like Dylan. And um, David Barrows, when I heard that there was the exhibit, um, I thought it would be critical. Um, and uh, um, then of course, I thought, why should I be surprised that it would focus on uh, the contributions of these Americans. Um, but Barrows as uh, a figure uh, was central, is central to this idea about, uh, this idea of um, a liberal education. He wrote the first uh, textbook, um, which, um, described the Philippine-American War as a misunderstanding between Filipinos. Um, uh, 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 Joy mentioned that he used the word cannibal for uh, Filipino um, ethnic groups, particularly the groups from Mindanao. Um, so so um, the first teachers, uh, Filipino teachers who had to read Barrow's book as, a young, as young students were inculcated with, were already, um, uh, it was already pressed in their minds about how to think and uh, interpret uh, history under the US rule. And uh, it was always about liberal ideas connected to American democracy. Uh, it was connected to um, uh, the wonderful contributions of uh, the American regime to backward primitive Filipinos. Um, that was how he wrote his book. His book was a very romantic, very Eurocentric, very racist uh, text, uh, textbook uh, for uh, school children. Um, and uh, these school children grew up to be, some of them grew up to be teachers. Um, and they um, swallowed that whole line, hook, line, and sinker, you know, um, uh, Panahon ng Americano time of peace, time of progress. Um, and so I think that we still have to, to do much to um, uh, erase and challenge and destroy this idea of uh, peacetime. Uh, peacetime meaning a time of peace under the Americans. I guess Thank I'm- Yes, Ricky, thank you. Please. Yeah, I'm next. Uh, so yeah, sorry, I'm gonna be looking down because I have my notes uh, written. Um, and also I'm making notes as I hear other uh, panelists uh, speak. So I have an opportunity to respond to what they're saying. Um, so, you know, I'm a product of a Philippine educational system, public school at that. So um, from uh, grade school to high school to um, my college years uh, at the University of the Philippines, you know, I, I saw uh, and I, I like this question, uh, you know, looking at education and forgetting, uh, and also, you know, what, um, the opposite of forgetting is remembering and what's the relationship, you know, between uh, what, what we remember and what we forget and through our educational system. Um, so um, I would say, you know, like I, I agree with um, Nerissa's point about uh, valorizing, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. and pretty much including the Spanish, right? Like I remember in, in grade school, uh, learning about history was about like the good things that the colonialists brought to the islands, right? So so basically, you know, oh yeah, the, the Spaniards brought Catholicism and can you imagine this country uh, without the Catholic faith, you know? And then we're grateful that it's been introduced and, you know, that's how we got into this, you know, like the civilized world of Christianity, right? And then, uh, for for the U.S., it's the public school system that that's been inculcated in my head. You know, without the United States, uh, um, you know, taking the, the the Philippines, you won't have the benefit of public education and and learning and uh, all these uh, textbooks that you're reading. But but, however, you know, to me, um, uh, I, I like. Uh, looking and also uh, narrowing down, you know, the focus on education and forgetting, because I, I do think that um, at the same time, I, I don't think we lack uh, materials and uh, particularly papers and primary sources and discussions around, you know, what actually happened. 
but how come they, my question is how come it's not highlighted uh, and uh, you know to never this point in this question how come we still forget and we don't remember because I do think that it's not simply uh, a question of education uh, and also you know it's particularly the formalized system of learning and education in in the Philippines I do think that um, uh, learning is also a battle of uh, memory or remembering and forgetting that seems to be uh, sometimes, yes, there's a role for education in all of this, but I think it should be, it should go beyond. I think it should go, uh, you know, th there is such a thing as, you know, uh, knowledge uh, or, you know, accountability, you know, around memory and uh, what, what we remember and what we learn because most of the time, I do think that um, even with people who went through education in the University of Philippines, like presumably one of the most liberal uh, spaces in the Philippines, there are still people who are thankful for, you know, the U.S. occupation, right? So why is that? Even though they went through this liberal education, uh, I do think it's because um, we haven't really been successful in the battle for uh, memory and, and remembrance, and there's no space for what we feel and what actually happened and how to make sense of what we're learning in school uh, in, in terms of you know, these uh, spaces that are outside uh, the formalized uh, university system and, and uh, sc uh, public school system. And also, uh, you know, if you go to many of our uh, uh, so-called you know, learning spaces, they are monuments to colonialism, right? You know, the, the entire University of the Philippines campus in Manila and in Diliman are by basically a valorization of these uh, American colonial periods. I'll stop there because I'm beyond three minutes. <laughs> okay, Dylan, please. So I, I'm just, I'm listening to, to the, I'm thinking through the question. I'm listening to Narisa and Ricky and, and you, you make me, think so deeply in this moment in real time about memory as a primary site of warfare, uh, and a never ending war. It's a never ending colonial war in particular. Uh, and I don't say that metaphorically, I don't say it uh, with, with multiple degrees of abstraction. I, I say it in the most material and abstract way simultaneously, that that's what memory does. Memory is, is central to the way wars are waged. Um, it's, set, it's, it's central to explaining why it is that um, you know, Philippinex people all over the planet live inside the violence of the of the U.S. conquest to this day, right? To this day, um, the memory is a site of warfare. Knowledge is a site of warfare. The problem is not merely one of forgetting. It's not reducible even to amnesia. Uh, but but I think it's 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 also necessary to identify the violence, the war at UC in particular, University of California in particular as how a certain kind of memory gets produced and legitimated, that we have to think about a, the practices of remembering, how these practices of remembering become part of a violent, ongoing colonial infrastructure. And that's what the University of California is. We can never forget that, that the University of California, from its foundation to the present, has always been an infrastructure of colonial power, um, from, from conquest to the present tense. So when we think about memory as a site of war, there are so many examples to draw from, again, in real time, the, the, the ongoing right-wing repression of, of what they call critical race theory, right, which is really a war on Black studies. It's really a war on gender and sexuality. It's really a war on anything that is, you know, non-normative to the kind of patriarchal white supremacist and anti-Black curriculum of public schooling. That is an actual war. These people are ready to throw down, and, and um, they, they commit all forms of of, of low intensity violence against the people who um, want to advocate for teaching that kind of critical work. There's also the war ongoing, war on education curriculum about Palestine. Anytime we mention Palestine, particularly in university settings, we face the most uh, heightened forms of, 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 of repression, you know, repression, um, death threats, et cetera. So the celebration of Barrows, uh, David Barrows at UC Berkeley uh, and, 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 and other places, is inseparable from these forms of war making. So I just wanna say, I'll finish these opening comments of mine by saying that the colleagues um, at UC Berkeley who were complicit in sanctioning uh, or even tolerating that Barrows exhibit, uh, I'll just say that you should be embarrassed of yourselves 
Um, I won't say you should be ashamed because I figure you probably don't feel shame if you're willing to be that close to barrels in the first place. Um, but 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 it's a complete embarrassment to you and the institution that you tolerated and sanctioned that exhibit. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think we we have to understand that that these liberal institutions, including and especially public universities, it, th these liberal institutions are colonial institutions, uh, and that's and that's that's um, that's paradigmatic. Thank you, Dylan. I, I I want to pick up on that because in fact, you know, sometimes we say in spite of the liberal education, we forget. But I want to like urge you a little bit more to, to just expand a little bit on this connection. You, you mentioned, Dylan, you know, the war that's going on with uh, a lot of interdisciplinary studies, black studies, ethnic studies and so forth. So maybe since you, all three of you are in uh, higher education in the U.S., although we have touched on the complicity of um, education and the Philippines, you know, here in the context of the U.S., as we know, the California system, which, of course, David Barrows went directly from the Philippines straight to um, the University of California. Could we talk a little bit about um, higher education here in the U.S. as the site of war and as the site of, you know, uh, organized forgetting or, um, yeah, can um, anybody want to respond also to each other uh, on this point about liberal education? and forgetting the fact that, of course, we're here together because it was the university that mounted this exhibit, right? It wasn't an outside private other institution. It was in within the hall, halls of the very liberal education that was the result of colonialism. Um, anybody would like to speak to that? Can I uh, just, you know, add, you know, I, I work for uh, the University of Michigan, which is another um, you know, a space. I, I do think that, you know, I, I think where we're headed now is like basically not just acknowledging the complicity of our university systems in the colonization of the Philippines and forgetting that that colonization happened, but also becoming instead of, um, you know, what's um, interesting about this whole conversation is like on one hand, um, we, we value liberal uh, education, right? But at the same time, you know, like, uh, for instance, in the case of Berkeley from, you know, uh, generations of scholars tried to learn critical thinking while at the same time learning it in a building called Burroughs Hall. <laughs> Burroughs, you know, you know, the, here in, the, in, in Michigan, you know, we, 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 we use uh, archival materials in our special collections library uh, named after D.C. Wooster, who's another academic who went. So you know, I, I do think that we need to start looking at uh, these colonizers as part of the university establishment. And, um, and, and that there's a direct link with you know, these academics in these universities and went to the Philippines, became colonial administrators, brought materials back into the United States that became then the epistemic infrastructure that we learn from, right? For instance, you know, like when you write Philippine history, you visit the Bentley Library here in Michigan or special collections or the Bancroft Library, and, and these are all spaces uh, like from the very structure down to the collections, and these are all colonial uh, uh, spaces and colonial collections. And, and then we create histories and knowledge out of these things, and this is how deeply embedded uh, colonialism is in our university. And I feel like uh, I do think that at some point we need to say, how do we stop perpetuating this? because it almost has a life on, uh, of its own. Uh, I know like the topic right now is afterlives, right? But it's actually continuing lives of uh, colonialism in many forms, deeply embedded in the universities and in our collections and the way we think and the way we analyze the very sources of history that we write. Great, thank you. Nerissa, you want to? Yeah, that was beautiful, um, uh, Dylan and Ricky. Uh, knowledge has been central to empire making. That's the reason why uh, the point of Ricky is that it's actually not an afterlife. Um, uh, colonialism continues in the very disciplines that we're part of. Um, and uh, I, I, would, I would hope that uh, looking uh, critically and um, acknowledging the violence of knowledge making, um, you know, uh, might be uh, 
important and a small step. I don't know if it's insignificant. I don't want to think that way because um, the, the very uh, the very premise of a lot of interdisciplinary studies. I'm thinking of Africana studies. I'm thinking of Asian American studies. Um, I'm thinking of other um, interdisciplinary interdisciplinary um, studies like um, feminist studies or post-colonial studies, you begin with a human figure that is uh, uh, not unimportant, the abject figure that uh, the empire considers as unimportant. And yet it is the subject of study. It is also the subject of violence. So um, Dylan has written about this, um, you know, the Filipino condition um, is intimately is intimately tied to the violence of the American imperial project. We exist in the archives of Michigan. We exist in the archives of UC Berkeley because of empire, because of war. So knowledge making and war has always been intimately tied. And I want to repeat what Dylan said. Um, you know, uh, the scholars who supported that egregious and really fucked up, you know, exhibition on the grand uh, men, the, the famous men of Berkeley and the famous Asianists who started the field of Southeast Asian studies, you know, in Berkeley, um, you should be aware that you just continue to perpetuate the violence of empire. And, you know, that's, that's on you. Dylan and I have talked about this before. Um, blood is on your hands. And that's something that I think they don't care about or they're not ashamed of. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah, re really, really quickly. I, first, I wanna acknowledge and honor and, and express gratitude for the fact that we start, we've started this conversation from the premise that the university and University of California, for that matter, the University of Michigan, in particular, are colonial sites and engines. I, I'm just really thrilled that we start from that as a premise that we don't have to work through proving that here. Um, that they're colonial sites and engines because they are think tanks, they're research centers, they're training grounds for officials, for bureaucrats, for planners and war makers. I, I appreciate that premise. Uh, I just wanted to add the fact that if we can start from that premise, then we should be um, even more distressed that university employed scholars by and large have yet to take full responsibility for this fact. That, it, that if universities are in fact an engine of coloniality, university employed scholars have yet to take responsibility for this fact in an active present tense way, especially. I think there's gestures of coming to terms with certain forms of colonial and imperial entanglement, but they tend to be compartmentalized and disavowing, meaning that's how we used to do shit. We don't do that no more, right? Like, I mean, this, it's like that. No, this is exactly what the university is. We, we have yet to really find a way to build a block to disrupt that and to come to terms with it. Um, and, and, and so I just, I appreciate if we begin from the, the same premise that we're talking about today, I think it literally changes everything we do by necessity. Great, so I would like to ask now what, um, how we can think about you know, I think we, many of you have pointed out the importance of um, uh, this colonial history in the, the current moment, but I want to, to draw out a little bit more what the significant implications of this are to this current moment. Let's, I, let's focus a little bit about, you know, the stakes of, um, of talking about this. Um, you know, whether it's drawing out your understanding about the politics of the exhibition, um, such as this, this framing and interpretation of Philippine history and um, U.S. empire, or perhaps simply, you know, the fact that the continuation of the colonial structures, what is at stake now, in, as we think, in broader context beyond the university of this afterlife? Um, how and why does this matter to contemporary politics? and conditions of life, both in the Philippines and here. Um, Dylan, why don't you take up that question first? Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to because it helps me funnel the endless reservoir of rage and anger I feel every time I hear these questions. Um, I mean, that's, 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 that's one part of my answer to your question, you know, is that, is that the genocidal violence of conquest and coloniality are always the stakes. Mm -hmm. They never go away. That violence is always with me. It, it, it stokes that endless reservoir of rage and anger toward the United States. 
um, toward the entire civilizational project that enabled that conquest, that brought me to this wretched fucking place, um, that put me in a place like Berkeley and made me, you know, what I am now. So my, my, I appreciate this question because it helps me understand over and over again how important it is to do more than just process that, that endless rage and anger, that, that, to, to do more than just process the violence that constitutes so many of us, that we actually need to weaponize it. Um, and I mean that in the most generous and dynamic interpretation of the term weaponize. I think it needs to, I think this, this, this endless way in which we are coerced into living with this violence needs to be weaponized intellectually and otherwise against the colonialist, against the neo-colonialist, against all of those that are complicit in the civilizational project. Um, which is to also say that this, the stakes are also this, the, you know, colonial power, if, if that's what we're gonna talk about in, in, its, in its infrastructure, you know, whether it's the university or something else, of course, it always requires rigorous analysis, confrontation and critique. However, the stakes of, the stakes of doing that work, analysis, confrontation, critique are if, you're, if we're interested in the possibility of a, liber, of a liberated and decolonized futurity, right? If that's what we're interested in, some of us are not, all right? So let me just say, I don't assume all of us are interested in that. Um, I'm desperate for a glimpse of that, okay? I don't know that I'm ready for it, <laughs> but, but I'm desperate for a glimpse of what it would be like to, to be able to, to, to be near, intimate with a liberated decolonized futurity. So, if, if that's what we have an interest in, if that's our commitment, including an epistemic futurity, right? If, if, if our knowledge, our way of knowing all that, then, then analysis, competition, critique are actually not adequate. That colonial power, and here's the stakes, Nefertiti, they actually require destruction. Um, and I wanna say that unapologetically, and this is something that I say as an, you know, somebody who identifies for a long time as an abolitionist, a lot, you know, myself, many colleagues, comrades in abolitionist struggle are constantly talking about how abolition is a creative, constructive presence, right? And we're always saying that. I wanna come back to the fact abolition also means you have to destroy things. You actually have to destroy things, no different than artists when they are making stuff, destroy things as they create, right? So destruction is a necessity if we are going to be confronting colonialism and coloniality and colonial power in any meaningful way. Destruction is what allows for possibilities for creativity and flourishing. And for that matter, the kind of futurity that I'm interested in being near and with. Thanks, Dylan. Please feel free, Nerissa and Ricky, to um, chime yeah. in. Or yeah, um, I wanted to uh, take up uh, Dylan's call about the necessity of destruction. And I think that, uh, I think that he's absolutely right. I, I think that destruction could be many things, what, what it could mean. And um, I like how Dylan said that we can, we need to weaponize this recognition of the violence of coloniality, and it has to be different ways. Um, and uh, I think that we saw some glimpse of destruction as a creative thing uh, when we saw Black Lives Matter, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, Matter um, activists who uh, asked, demanded um, for the destruction of statues that were part of the history of slavery. Um, there has, of course, there were other actions that were done uh, by BLM activists, and I, I think that when I was watching and uh, paying attention to the arguments of these activists, I was trying to think about how that would, what would that look like for Filipino, Filipinex studies? Um, what would we destroy? What would we change? What would we abandon? So I think that, that that's a, a beautiful thing to think about um, rejecting, destroying, uh, you know, um, overturning um, everything that we thought um, about Filipino studies, Filipinex studies, or Filipino American studies. So um, I, I have to to be honest that uh, I think that 
the call to end or change violently the ways we teach, uh, the way we understand the, our place in the university um, is a serious thing that we all need to do, uh, particularly because it really feels like the end times, right? I mean, uh, and it's, it's not a bad thing. I think that uh, um, it's important to think of endings so that there could be new beginnings, I think. Yeah, you know, um, this conversation reminds me of uh, this book I read last year. Um, it's called uh, Potential History and Learning Imperialism by uh, Ariella Asule. And um, I do think that, um, you, you know, how, how do we unlearn imperialism? <laughs> how do we unlearn it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, like one of the things you have here is, uh, you know, uh, memory. And you know all these um, devices that we we created or universities created as a way for uh, us to keep remembering uh, and valorizing and worshiping uh, colonial actors uh, and and perhaps you know like for instance so one thing that you know I don't know if it's widely known but Ferdinand Marcus got an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from the University of Michigan in 1966. Um, and, and it's one of those things where, you know, like, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm in a space, I worked for a university that not only basically saw the Philippines as a kind of colonial project, it's a University of Michigan project, you know, creating all of these uh, knowledge uh, structures and infrastructure and the legal system and all that in the Philippines, and then bringing collections here, and then furthering the um, uh, colonial uh, infrastructure by bringing Filipinos here to be educated. I, I often tell my students, you know, it's almost like, uh, I said, you know, I say a hundred years ago, this is not possible. Filipinos came here to be civilized. And now I'm a professor and I'm teaching. And I'm, you know, um, and, and I, I do think that part of this is us persisting and thriving in our respective universities and never giving up. Uh, I admire uh, Dylan's uh, passion and candor. Uh, I wish I have the same kind of, you know, like uh, uh, spirit. Um, I'm, I'm angry, but as you all know, you know, uh, we all uh, show our anger in different ways. Uh, and, and, but I often share that frustration and anger. I, I often go to uh, university spaces and I see Oh my gosh, you know, at these steps, I would remember Marcos was given this kind of uh, honorary degree and now people are using all these so-called credentials as a way to uh, show uh, to people back home in the Philippines as how great this president was, you know, and, and all of these things. So I, I do think that, you know, all of these uh, complicity need to be uh, examined. Uh, one way is, I would say, is, you know, this notion of epistemic justice or epistemic injustice, the opposite of it is like, you know, like, um, you know, uh, particular people uh, being given uh, their uh, uh, dignity as knowers, as um, um, people who uh, witness certain things. And I, I do think that, you know, in, in uh, organizing events like this, you know, it, it puts the spotlight on Filipino scholars as knowers, uh, as, you know, and our knowledge is actually worth uh, uh, pursuing. And, and, and for us to provide, you know, uh, you know the, the many paths to uh, basically unlearning imperialism. Uh, and because, uh, you know, I, I do think that, that that's the task at hand here, you know, how do we unlearn imperialism in the very specific places where actually these uh, imperialistic uh, knowledge are uh, continually being re recreated? Thanks, Ricky. In fact, I'm so very glad that you brought up the Marcuses because, of course, we are now facing the same kind of suppression of history as we approach the Philippine elections as the son of the current, uh, as the uh, son of the former dictator uh, is now up for um, uh, president. Um, and um, I think that also uh, 
we, I mean, in many ways, you've all kind of demonstrated how important the stakes are um, because of this continuing colonialism and the very concrete effects that we're facing now in the present. So on the one hand, you have this political situation in the Philippines where we can so suppress history and so identify with the orders of power that the possibility of a return of a dictator, right, um, is so imminent. And at the same time, in the, un in, the, in, in the United States, the identification with the colonizers that has led uh, many Filipinos also to support white supremacy um, and to support uh, Trump and you know, to be on the side of politics. I think there are many implications to draw out here, um, but I will ask you to just reflect a little further before I ask the final question. Um, does anybody would like to add a little bit um, more to this discussion about the stakes of this intervention that we are making now and that the unlearning of imperialism and the destruction and what i hear is you know for the possibility that we may flourish in another uh kind of future yeah i'd, I'd like to try and, and answer um this question uh nefriti when the january 6 uh, coup happened I remember that uh, there was some discussion on social media of uh, a Filipino Trump supporter with a uh, with a, a broom Walis. and um, a walis. Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, those of us who uh, know uh, that Filipino Americans are always uh, have have this horrible record of. Uh, being closer to the Republican Party and uh, uh, vote Republican. Um, so uh, among Asian American groups, uh, Filipinos are, are very active in the Republican uh, Party. Um, so it wasn't a surprise that uh, in the coup, um, uh, there would be a Filipino who would support um, uh, you know, um, white supremacy and Trump uh, and all that. But um, I think that uh, when I started studying Asian American studies um, uh, at Berkeley, what I was really turned off uh, by, you know, the earlier um, texts for Filipino American history and culture was that there was always this, um, there was always this narrative of how Filipinos uh, supported the United States during World War II. Uh, many Filipinos uh, are active in the US military, etc. cetera. And um, when I was uh, a grad student, I, I didn't have the language to, to talk about how that very, that very history, the participation of Filipinos in the US military that goes back to the empire, that goes back to the creation of the Philippine constabulary, that goes back to the creation of the police, the Philippine national police, you know? So, um, so I wanted to just, and, and uh, Nefertiti has done a, a, you know, um, a lot of uh, writing on this about um, understanding fascism, global fascism, uh, and to understand that, you know the war on drugs, the war on uh, the war on terror. Uh, uh, these are all uh, different um, iterations of um, of war uh, or the rule of war, right? Um, and um, and Filipinos have learned their American lessons so well, which is the reason why anti-communism is uh, very, you know, very much a part of Filipino culture. Um, militarism is part of Filipino culture. That's the reason why immigrants um, uh, are drawn to being part of uh, either the police or the military, US, the US Army uh, when they move, um, you know, when they migrate to the US. So I think that um, this is all to say that uh, these institutions that we consider as, uh, you know, uh, part of our legacy from the United States, you know, um, our governmental structures or our ways of understanding um, institutions. Um, that's part of the forgetting too. We uh, don't understand that um, before there was the war against uh, drug addicts, 
uh, you know, the war against the poor because Duterte's war is a genocide of the poor. There was the war against the insurrecto and later it was the, the a war against the hook, the hooks. Well, before the hooks, there was the war against socialist farmers, you know, so um, the enemy of the Philippine state has always been a creation of the American colonial government and later on by Filipino elites. So we have to think about uh, these uh, targets of Philippine state violence because they are um, uh, those who are subjected to Philippine state violence, um, whether in the colonial past or the current time, um, you know, this is still part of this, this history of um, the Philippines as a colony. So um, that man waving the banig, um, you know, um, being part of that white supremacist space of uh, the coup in January, on January 6, um, you know, he's, uh, he's a figure that connects to these histories of militarism um, and Philippine state violence. We participate in that. We willingly do that. Thank you. Dylan, some thoughts? Yeah, um, I'm, it reminds me always that, you know, to be, to, be, to be engaged in any form of collective work, collective work that deals with the stakes that we're talking about um, means that everybody who's here, you know, watching and listening and taking this in, regardless of your position in your day job, it requires that we participate in some form of actual abolitionist decolonization and or anti-colonial community, <laughs> collective struggle, movement, organization, something. And, and I wanna say to demystify what I mean by that, right? Cause sometimes people get an image in their, get a, kind of an idea in their head about what it means to be part of these communities. Though being part of struggles for abolition, decolonization, anti-colonialism and really just liberation can take so many different forms. Um, all I'm urging people to do is, is, is find the form that feels good to them. It can, for many folks recently, during this pandemic, this ongoing pandemic, it's meant joining local mutual aid projects, right? As an abolitionist departure from charity and philanthropy project, right? Mutual aid is a whole other kind of liberating praxis that actually gives you a little bit of a peek into the liberated futurity and decolonized futurity that I'm talking about, a little peek. It's not the final be all end all solution, but it gives you a peek. Um, I've, I've, I've been privileged to be invited and to be um, incited as well by forms of collective study, right? Forms of collective study. People, people, more and more people, I think, globally are taking the project, the decolonizing, abolitionist, anti-colonial, liberationist practice of collective study really seriously, especially outside the United States and thankfully increasingly inside this beast of the United States, right? And the reason, because people are desperate and urgent about building a shared analysis of immediate surrounding conditions, right? Whatever they feel and mean as surrounding conditions. Um, and, and just to acknowledge some of the stuff that's popping off in, in, in chat and Q and A, at the, at, you know, one of the more, most immediate projects as an ongoing one, which is I think more complicated than some uh, of, our, of our colleagues and friends want to give it credit for is that, you know, this requires a decolonization in some ways an abolition of Filipino American studies actually. I, I would argue, you know, um, in part because of its of its foundationally patriotic relationship to the U.S. nation building project, um, but also because you know so many of the guiding and paradigmatic assumptions that that shape the field, if they're to be decolonized, means that the field actually can't exist, you know. And this is this is not to, you know it's to say that the epistemic and, and and archival structure of how you know people in U.S. based Filipinos come to know themselves through this history, that actually requires a foundational shift, a foundational change. So I think that's, all these things are part of the stakes, but I also wanted to make sure that I, I just got at, you know, what we call Filipino American studies a little bit. Um, and, and that's to say that the only people who I let call me Filipino American are my cousins in the Philippines. They just call me a Phil, you know, Phil M's, Phil M's. And I, I let them get, a, I let them do that. But I would, in the, in the US context, I would never call, I've never once, I never will call myself a Filipino American ever. Well, you're getting at to my last question, actually, Dylan, because you're providing some concrete ways to think about how we create a radical futurity now. So let's stay with this question a little bit. In fact, it's also already um, in the in the uh, Q and A. But um, but let let me phrase it this way first before we get to the actual Q and A. Right? Um, give us some ways 
to think about, you know, alternatives for, um, you, you've already started Dylan, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, go to Ricky first, but give us some ways that, you know, people, and there, as you mentioned, there are a whole variety of ways that people can participate in creating a radical future now. So do you want to give us some examples or suggestions or thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I love the idea of this collective study because it does make me think, for example, that we often rely on these institutions for the authority to create history. And yet there are so many ways that we could tell this history, create exhibitions ourselves outside of these institutions and not think that these that these institutions have the authority to tell our history mm -hmm. um but ricky please yeah so you know i'm i'm interpreting this question based on my own area of expertise i'm, I'm a professor of archives and digital curation and uh i was like thinking because i saw this question ahead of time and i said okay what's what's the radical future is it um basically burning all the archives and museum artifacts uh, burning down the you know what 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 does dismantling white supremacy mean and look like uh my take on that is like you know um the the, the radical path for me is like you know and uh, acknowledging on one hand that uh, the, the archival materials we have uh, the educational infrastructures that we have uh, are all colonial and that uh, the, the knowledge we build out of these materials uh, you know will present particular um, logics you know colonial logics and it's it's there on one hand that's there and and but on the other hand we need these sources, these evidence, right? As a way to show the world that this actually happened. Uh, this is what's frustrating for me in this country. You know, you go to any archival repository, look at the Philippine materials, you will see, you don't even have to invent, you just have to open your eyes. You don't even have to do any, you know, like super, uh, like deep uh, against the grain reading or just open your eyes, look at the photo. You'll see the, the different human rights violation and abuse that Filipinos got, right? And yet there's not enough conversation. No one is, I, I don't think people are brought to justice. And one interpretation I have here is like, well, you know, can we, uh, following Dylan's point about, you know, warfare and battlefields, you know, can we look at the archive as one of the areas, right? Like for me, what I'm doing here in Michigan is actually doing the hard work of collaborating with people in charge of these collections, doing reparative description, you know, acknowledging that, you know, we should not honor the people who collected these materials, but the people that are represented in these collections, you know, uh, sometimes the, the radical act is the most simple, like meaning fix the metadata, correct the catalog, fix the provenance of these collections. And I, I do think that, you know, um, you, sometimes we think that the radical act is something that's beyond our reach, but actually for me, it's something uh, to me, the most radical thing that I've done in the past two years during the pandemic is to go back to the University of Michigan and say, the university is complicit to Philippine colonization. The materials we have here are evidence of that. What are we doing? Give us you know, the resources and give us space to work on this. And they did. And I do think that's you know, a kind of victory. And, but we need more of that. It's not happening enough. And I do think, you know, I mean, I'm challenging my colleagues in Berkeley, just do it. Start doing it. Do the radical act. Nerissa, the last word before we turn to Q and A. And I, I know Ricky as uh, an archivist and how he um, has this very, uh, very critical approach to reading. And um, I think going off of what uh, um, Ricky just said, uh, I think the radical act is also learning how to read, learning how to look. You know, so I'm really um, angry at how there are some uh, art historians or art study scholars or photography scholars, uh, some cultural study scholars who say that we should be suspicious of a, a text, you should be, um, you shouldn't, uh, um, you know, uh, 
take seriously the visual or what you see, but I think that the first, the first um, act of looking is necessary and important. Um, uh, I, I echo what um, Ricky said. I don't believe in burning the archives. I believe in letting the archives be accessible to everybody. Look at the horror. Look at our history. This is this is our this is our legacy. This is what we. This is our dark patrimony. We own those those artifacts in Michigan, in Berkeley, in the University of Chicago. We can make an entire list of all the American colonial officials who were presidents or um, educators um, in their universities after their Philippine stint, their Philippine years, and they moved back to the US and they became Philippine experts. We should look at these, these images and texts because that's how we can, we can dismantle. I believe reading and engaging with these violent materials is part of uh, the first step in, in decolonizing the archives. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to make some space for, um, for uh, people in the audience and the questions they've brought. And um, I might just, uh, Fritzi, should I just go ahead and read? Uh, I've, I'm seeing them right now. Yeah, um, go ahead. Okay, so this is a question from Ellen Ray Cachola. How do you deal with working class and migrant Filipinos who are intimately tied to settler colonial industries in the Philippines and abroad for livelihood and material survival? How can we understand their positionality and agency, not as those Filipinos who are not with us and should be destroyed, but as Filipino peoples who have a particular insight that we should consider um, about how imperialism unresolved, unresolved evolves into settler colonial dependencies? Who would like to um, take a stab at that? <coughs> hard. That's a hard question, and that is uh, a real question because this is these are the these are our members of our communities. These are the migrant workers who uh, might not be in the spaces that we're in because uh, they are working class. Um, they're um, very, their desire to survive the conditions of their lives, unfortunately, demands that they willingly join or uh, become part of the U.S. Army. Right um, in the Philippines, uh, to survive or to escape poverty, you become a cop. You join the Philippine National Police. Um, I think that um, understanding class and class and migration, the history of migrants to the U.S. Uh, or just the global diaspora, I think that um, this is another way for us to to complicate um, how we think of Filipino studies or Filipino studies. Um, I, I, I think that this is a way that we can do away with that narrative of patriotism, you know, how we um, are the good little brown brothers that willingly help Uncle Sam. Um, we are forced to be part of Uncle Sam's military industrial complex because of the conditions in the Philippines. We are forced to become part of Philippine state violence because of the conditions in the Philippines, you know? So I think that there has to be a recognition of the difficult lives of migrant workers, what they're forced to, to do. Um, and then maybe we start there rather than thinking of patriotism and a willingness to um, just to become Republicans or become cops, you know, something like that. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, can, I, can I think about the question just a little bit too? Yeah, um, I, So, so I, I wanna play with the question a little bit. Um, 
while also honoring the spirit of the question, which is to say that I think most of the people that um, that I know, most of the people in the, in the Philippine X diaspora, you know, if we want to call it that, that I know, probably most people here are probably intimately tied to settler colonial industries. I mean, we started with that, right? Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying across class positions, okay? So I'm saying across class positions, this is the thing we have to fuck around with, okay? Because there's this notion that, that to be tied to settler colonial industries means that one is um, in the positions of being um, in, in the most grinding working class or even, or even kind of proletariat lumpen positions, which is often the case. But what I think happens in those narratives is it lets um, people who inhabit other class positions off the hook, which is to say that those of us who have day jobs at places like University of California, University of Michigan, and, and elsewhere, probably a lot of the folks that are on this call that are listening to us now talk right now, um, are also intimately tied to settler colonial structures, ind industrial and otherwise. So I think we need to deal with that simultaneously um, with this question of the class position and the antagonisms that come with the class position. Okay, that gets to my to the other point, which is um, some of many of us, I think, within our own immediate and extended, you know, blood and ex, you know, and and and, and extra blood families, um, can say that we have family members who represent some cross section of these class positions um, across the globe. Okay, so so how do we deal with how do we deal with the antagonisms that come when we get together, you know, at Pasco or whatever, and people start talking, right? Well, you fucking fight. You fight with each other, right? Like we fight with each other. We start yelling at each other and arguing with each other. So, so like in the spirit of this question, I wanna say that. That is actually what all of us need to be doing. We need to be fighting and we need to be debating. We need to be arguing yeah. with each other. Because you, you know, we, we can't let bullshit go by because lives are at stake, man. Like it's, 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 not, it's not just some ideological, it's not merely an ideological argument, right? It's an ideological argument it's a, that, that, that's tied to the, the most immediate forms of um, political and material asymmetry that make people suffer. Okay, so, so I can't wait to see my, my favorite Tita Chai. I hope she reads this. I hope she, she sees this video. My, my, my favorite Tita Chai. Right, who my who my who my cousin Chari tells me is a pro Duterte supporter, right? Because she wants him, she wants to clean up the streets and all that shit, right? I can't wait to get together with her so we can start yelling at each other because I think she'll I think she'll kind of respect me. I think she'll kind of listen to me while we're yelling at each other, but but we have to fight this out, right? I can't I can't I can't live with Tita Chai believing that. I can't do it. I just can't do it. So um, so so in 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 that sense, I think um. The, the analytical insight, you know, needs to be, I think it, it needs to be tethered to a narrative storytelling project, which is what I think is missing, right? Like, you know, th these reactionaries all have really good stories to tell from QAnon forward and people buy into that shit and run with it, right? They go with that and they start, they, 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 make, they make all kinds of things happen based on those stories. I think, I think we need to tell better stories Right? I need to tell better stories. I think we need to, to develop um, uh, factual fictions that make sense, that resonate, and are also unapologetically radical in the sense that they get at the roots of these problems. That, and, and, and the last point I'll make is that, is that many, many people, including me, who inhabit class positions that are relatively privileged on the planet, um, we oftentimes make the mistake of presuming that people who are in class oppressed positions are somehow automatically reactionary and hostile um, to analytical and rigorous thinking, right? Huge mistake, huge mistake. And the reason I say that is because once Tita Chai and I start yelling at each other, what I, what I can guarantee you will happen is that she's gonna start saying shit that is actually, if it's not abolitionist and anti-colonial, it's proto-abolitionist and proto-anti-colonial because she wants liberation in some way. We just have like a severe difference in how we understand getting at that point, right? And we probably have to, argue with each other over what freedom also means, okay? But she's gonna say some shit that's gonna actually be abolitionist and anti-colonial. And my job is to tell her that. It's like, see, you're not, you're not this Duterte piece of shit that I thought you were. You're actually on my side and here's why.
right? So I think I think some rigor in how we in how we fight is also what some of us have skill sets to bring, and I think we we need to gift that and socialize that, uh, as well as weaponize it. Okay, thank you. And um, I, you know, although I'm not one of the panelists, I, I do want to say one little thing um, about this question, which is um, that I agree with Nerissa and Dylan, uh, the need for new stories, and it's a complex question, but I also want to add that, um, you know, that there are structures that are, that go beyond, you know, particular kinds of ideological consciousness that we can't only attack this from the point of view of like, you know, changing minds, changing hearts and minds. The US will go to war just to change your mind. You know, I mean, there's a lot of like material force behind the changing of minds. So we do want to think about those structures within which people um, are forced to live. But the second thing I want to say also, which is in keeping with what Dylan just said, is that what people do for survival isn't only capitulation, that they bring with them and our people have many instances of certain kinds of affective, cognitive, you know, social forms of intelligence and aspiration that perhaps get subsumed underneath all of the, these um, ideologies of empire and identification. But they are there and it's up to us all, also to recognize our strengths and to parse out the socialities of survival that people have. Um, and that's that's something that I would like to uh, put on the table. But let me ask the, the second question here, which is about precisely imagining a new future. Um, and here I, I'm going to collapse two questions because they are about the university. Um, actually, the last three questions are about the university. One question by Sunita Muki is, please help us imagine a new future of Philippine American studies. Um, paint us a picture, who shall speak, represent? Filipino, Filipino history. That's one question about education. And the second one is uh, about suggestions for decolonized educational strategies for those in the STEM fields in higher education. So on the one hand, you know, Phil Am studies, Filipino studies, Philippine studies, no one's actually talking about area studies, Southeast Asian studies, right? Um, and then um, STEM fields where many, uh, many folks are also in. And then there's a more specific question about what should UC Berkeley do? So I'll save that to the end, but can any of you address Filipino American studies or decolonizing STEM fields? I'm happy to get started on this real quick. And this okay. is my, 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 way, my way of propping up. It, it sort of is an answer mostly to the first question, but maybe maybe it, 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 it's, it's related to the other two as well. I was very privileged recently to be invited into conversation with um, the first full-fledged devoted abolitionist organization that's Philippines-based that I know of called Abolicion. I'm gonna put the links in the chat in just a second. Um, but I think about groups like this, um, who are actively undertaking the work of carceral police abolition in the Philippine context, who are reading and studying deeply, who are working with, who are, who are trying to work in some kind of, with some kind of responsibility and relationship with the black radical abolitionist tradition, which is something that I spent time talking to them about, um, and, and is dead serious about making direct interventions on every level of politics from municipal to national and beyond, um, and wants to build movement by way of global support for their work um, as Philippine-based abolitionists. So when I think about that first question about the, this future, this futurity, right? This futurity around study. I was called the futurity around Philippine study. Okay. Um, in, in my view, the 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 one of the best examples of of the type of collective that could represent one of the trajectories for Philippine study, right? And I'm and I'm again I'm 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 echoing the notion of black study that's as old as black studies itself, right? If we're gonna start to think about Philippine study, then I think about groups and organizations like Abolicion because they're organizers, they're thinkers, they're building curricula, they're writing essays, they're doing all kinds of shit. I will put the links, oh, they've got a bunch of videos. I'll put, the, I'll put three links in the chat so you all can check it out yourselves, but wait until after we're all done talking. Um, I'll just say that for as long as we, um, I do think we should front and center the idea that what whatever version of the work we do, it has to be 
about dismantling white supremacy. Because I do think that it's basically the root of all of these things, right? Like, how come, like going to, I actually know Ellen. Hi, Ellen, I, I miss you. I miss seeing you in conferences. Um, uh, you know, the idea that certain lives uh, and bodies and cultures are inferior, you know, that's where it begins, right? Like, you know, like you, you ask, like, how come Filipinos are poor and they have to go um, and become domestic helpers, care for other people's children? and send money back home. And you know, all of these and, and, and cheapening, uh, like basically our bodies are cheap to some people, right? You know, you go to certain spaces, you automatically feel that kind of imposed inferiority on, on Filipinos. And I, I do think that, you know, the, the goal is to, I think it's, it's white supremacy, you know, like basically uh, who taught Filipinos that the only way to survive poverty in the Philippines is to become a domestic helper. You know, I'm not saying this is a bad thing necessarily, but it seems to me that there's there's a big, uh, you know, ideological and systemic uh, notion that certain bodies, certain people, and by the way, you know, like this happens too when you go to Singapore, right? Like how you're treated as Filipino in, in another country, you know? So I think there's this kind of logic that we're up against. And to me, I'm not giving up on the idea of, you know, like how do we uh, use area studies? How do we use Philippine studies? How do you use these spaces? And these spaces, I think, should function as a way to dismantle white supremacy because that's the very, for me, the very logic that's in operation that we should be in opposition. I don't know. Okay. Okay, Nerissa. Yeah. Um. I I wanted to mention that the, the new future uh, that uh, Sunita Muki was asking. Hi, Sunita. We're very good friends. Um. Uh, Sunita Muki was asking about what the future would look like for um, uh, Filipino studies, Philippinex studies. I think it's beginning now. Uh. Because, um. When I started. As a graduate student, I remember this story. I, I say this all the time when I'm with other Asian Americanists and Filipino studies scholars. Um, there was an undergrad who told me that Sumalangit uh, Nawa, rest in peace, uh, um, Takaki, um, uh, Ron Takaki, Ronald Takaki once said that um, 1898 has nothing to do with uh, Filipino immigrant history. And I, I didn't believe that because of course he wrote a book on the 19th century. I didn't think that that was true. But um, whether Takaki said that or not, I know that as, as Dylan will, will attest, there are scholars, there are community members who think that a discussion of empire is not necessary or important uh, in understanding uh, Filipino migration history. Um, so I, I think the future is, is here. I think it is beginning. I'm very excited about this uh, Philippine-based abolitionist group that is looking at the Philippine police um, as a colonial institution. Um, uh, for my group, um, my organization, Malaya New York, we also have a study group. Uh, there are um, young activists that are studying the history of the Philippine National Police and its relationship to the NYPD. I've learned this from other activists that the NYPD and the PNP or the Philippine National Police actually collaborate. Um, uh, they have projects uh, and um, there is military support for the PNP from the NYPD. So, um, I think that this is the start that, you know, um, study is the beginning of dismantling these colonial structures. Study begins um, this act of tearing apart, disarticulating, um, taking apart uh, coloniality um, that permeates our lives, uh, our jobs, uh, our realities. You know, um, the way we understand history in the world um, was in a way um, very much influenced by the creation of the camera. You know, um, this is something that uh, Gina Apostol has in her uh, beautiful novel, um, Insurrecto. Um, the way the world 
um, began to see or understand the truth, the idea of what is a fact was created by the camera. And the camera itself is very much implicated in war, um, in military surveillance, in different forms of violence. So um, uh, I think that we have to go back. We have to understand that the act of looking, uh, the act of tearing apart or taking apart um, these histories, these ugly histories, um, it begins with looking and critiquing and understanding. And then it goes back to Dylan's point too. Uh, we have to be in community. We have to be in conversation. We have to have these battles and, and um, you know, uh, a fight with each other, our, our loved ones, um, uh, the members of our communities who uh, are very much invested in institutions like uh, the U.S. Army or uh, American education or um, the idea of middle classness and whiteness. Um, we have to have these difficult conversations and hopefully, you know, we will be able to be in community with each other, even if our antagonisms are there. Then, of course, there is the larger community of scholars, I think, who are all here uh, on this uh, call. Um, you know, um, uh, it begins with us. It begins uh, with the project of, of dealing with white supremacy and coloniality, the violence of coloniality, it begins with us and the work we do, the research and the teaching we do. Yeah, so so can, can I just uh, say something about the STEM education? Because I do think, you know, it's, it's actually yes. very important that we acknowledge that question. Yes. Um, you know, I, I you know, um, it's a struggle. Like in my own work here in Michigan, for instance, you know, often you, you talk to um, some people in the sciences and even in the co collecting in the sciences, for instance, you know, people who collect snails and ferns and all of these life forms that are in museums in this university. And then you go and you say, we need to decolonize this. And then they start saying, well, we got these legally. We are following certain scientific procedures. So, and then you say, well, you know, what, how did you start collecting things? What made it possible for you to even collect that and name that and be part of the collection of university? It's colonialism. And that's, I think that's the hook, right? That there's no neutral scientific work. What got us into deep uh, social problems right now is social media, right? In, in, you know, the Duterte administration was made possible by Facebook. You know, you know, the computer scientists and the engineers, the technical people that we produce in our universities, you know, like I, I do think that, you know, like e even like, for instance, policies around public health, you know, look at the history of public health in the Philippines and how it's, you know, and my earlier work, actually, I was doing research on the segregation of people with leprosy uh, in the Philippines, you know, um, and how it was an American policy that allowed the segregation of people because of their disease, right, uh, in the Philippines. And it was easier to experiment on Filipinos uh, on experimental treatment of leprosy because they couldn't do it here in the United States, you know. So, you know, the, these policies and scientific procedures uh, are not neutral. Uh, they are also built in many of these colonial, and I, I do think that, you know, that's when area studies, the humanities, and history will matter, right? Because you can begin to unpack the problematic nature of the, the sciences that we often valorize. Thank you, Ricky, for addressing the STEM question um, and, you know, the politics of the sciences and scientific knowledge production. In fact, the only thing I would add to that is that the part of the politics of certain kinds of uh, sciences is to diminish the epistemologies of indigenous and native peoples, our own epistemologies and our own ways of knowing and to consider these inferior. Mm -hmm. And I think there's uh, the, a lot of native uh, science studies and feminist science studies are showing us the forms of epistemology that we are actually ignoring because we assume them to be inferior to um, science and science itself is actually extracting and drawing on those very forms of knowledge production um, of natives. And that has been the history of science. Um, so. I feel like I need to, we are at 1023, 
And I we there's so many more questions on the chat. I hope um, we are going to get a record of them and and share it with you. But I feel my job is to turn this over uh, to Fritzi once again. Uh, and I would like to personally thank the three of you um, for really an in, a, a, such a provocative, illuminating, uh, and inspiring discussion. Um, and um, so, really, thank you. I was honored to do this, and I. So honored to have you all speak on these issues. Fritzi. Wow, thank you so much, Nefertiti, Dylan, Ricky, Narisa. Um, I'm out of words. It's just so amazing. I think that just gathering here tonight, having this conversation, that's already a beginning of creating, right? Of creating something, building community, learning from each other. That's already one thing. So I hope that tonight, oh wow, there's like 15 new messages on the chat already. So I just wanna thank everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I hope this is not the last thing that we get to see each other and be in conversation with each other. Let's continue, you know, working together collectively and, and fight, right? Yeah, so I am in awe of all of you and thankful for all of you for, for sharing with us. So many friends are texting me already and, you know, we're really happy to tune in and learn so much. And so thank you all. I hope we can do this again, hopefully in person or maybe virtually if it's more accessible. Well, all thank right. you, Fritzy. Everybody's saying thank you, Fritzy, for getting us all together. Thank here. you, Fritzy. Thank you thank all you. too. Really appreciate you all.